Welcome to another HPBA webinar. I am your host, Marilyn French, and our topic today is business succession. Most people in the trade have been a part of this industry for many years, and for each of us, there comes a time when we leave the trade. Hopefully, that occurs at a time and in a manner of your choosing. Today, we are going to speak with the eight individuals who make up Profits Plus Solutions Business Advisors. Each of the eight has a specific niche of expertise. Individually and collectively, they will help make your desires become plans and then become action. You have worked a lifetime in your business. Now make your business work for you. When you decide you are ready to transition out of the business, in addition to deciding who the next owner will be, family member, employee, or outsider, there are many components to be addressed the price, terms, and structuring the transaction to minimize the taxes. Let's visit with each of the experts and ask them questions that are likely to be relevant to you and your business. Our first expert is Troy Patton. Troy Patton is a certified public accountant and has obtained his accredited business valuation certification by the AICPA. He is also a resource to a half dozen banks for valuation issues involving SBA lending. Okay, Troy, first question. A business broker or realtor can evaluate a business for sale. How does that differ from what you do? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So really simply put is a valuation expert has to be an advocate for their opinion as opposed to a client. And so oftentimes we come up with valuation numbers that are a bit different from those who are uh, brokers. And not to say that brokers don't do a good job or a realtor doesn't do a good job, but we actually look at it from a completely independent uh, standpoint to see what that business is worth. And when doing that, we utilize all the different methodologies and approaches to ensure that we've covered all the bases uh, to make sure that we that, that opinion of value um, is, is truly independent. Okay, thank you. Now, next question. In a period of years, can an owner increase the value of their business to a prospective buyer? Yeah, another great question. Absolutely. Um, a, a business owner can use – they can use a lot of different tools, obviously, to increase the value of their business. Um, so that way when it comes time to sell that business, they can obtain that top dollar. I think one of the great ways to do that is actually using – uh, information that is in evaluation to see what other competitors are doing, to see where where their numbers are at, their margins are at, what they're what they are doing or what they aren't doing, and then trying to utilize that same information to create additional profits. Um, one of, one of the things that uh, working with a lot of business owners, you know, just over the years, that when they look at their financial statements, they run their financial statements as if if I have cash, I'm good. Cash is king. That's all great. I think when it comes time to sell, it, it's trying to enhance the the value of that cash. And what I mean by that is is trying to create as much cash as possible by eliminating maybe other expenses or expanding margins in certain areas or our mix of products that we sell. And by doing that, it, it's actually uh, um, we've done, we've actually worked with quite a few business owners in the past, and I think it's a great way, obviously, to uh, enhance the value of that business over the next even possible 12 to 18, even 36 months. Okay, great information. Thank you, Troy. Following Troy Patton is Henry Hutchison. Henry Hutchison specializes in family businesses and closely held partnerships transition their business from one generation. To he is a family business advisor and advanced family business advisor. Okay, Henry, here's your first question. If a business is going to transition from one family member to another, do they need to plan in advance of the transition? Oh, well, thank you for having me on. Uh, well, of course, and absolutely. <clears throat> um, there are, it's interesting, but so two-thirds of family businesses fail to transition from one generation to the next. So those are obviously bad bad statistics, 
<clears throat> so planning is, you know, the number one thing that you can do in order to improve your odds. There's a study that I, I can't quote you the source, but there's a study out there that they took family businesses that started planning as far as 10 years out. Now, when you're planning 10 years out, it's really just kind of a conversation. Um, but the more, the closer you get to the date of transition, the worse your odds become. So you increase your odds the further out you go in planning your transition. So let me, I guess, let me talk of, of let me talk to a couple things that you should be doing. Um, number one, obviously, is you know who, who is it that we're talking about transitioning to? Um, is there a next generation? So you have kids. Um, one, two, three, or a nephew or a niece or something like that. <clears throat> and the question is, are they interested in taking over this business? Are they interested in running this business? And are they capable of running this business, right? They're two totally different things. Yes, I'm interested. I see there's money and I want to run the place, but I'm not very good at it. Or, hey, I can do it. It's no problem, but it's really not my thing. That matters too. So you have to have sufficient interest and capability <clears throat> demonstrated and stated by the next generation. Now, with that said, you take a 25-year-old, you take a 28-year-old, they're going to say they're interested and they have capability, but really now it becomes a piece of development. So part of the planning process is the development and the assessment process of, okay, you say you're interested, but we really kind of need to see if you're going to continue to be interested and will be capable when you become 33, 35, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the timing is. The second piece is from a planning perspective is from a transition. Somebody's coming in and somebody's going out. That person going out or those people going out, they need to have a plan also. When are you leaving? How are you leaving? Do you need money to get out of this thing? Um, do you really know what you're going to be doing when you're on the other side of this thing? Um, are you just going to step out and go to Florida and play golf? Or are you going to want to hang around and take a lesser position? You kind of need to work through the fact that you'll be stepping back and somebody will be stepping into your place. <clears throat> so that needs to be worked on as well. The third piece is, and so let's say that you've got the interest, you've got the capability, and the, the current generation is going to step back. The third piece is if you have multiple kids, are they going to be able to get along well enough together in the workplace to be able to run this place? Because if they're not, now you've got a big problem on your hands. So part of the planning that you need to do beforehand is you know, you've got step one, step two. Step three is, okay, let's talk about you all running this place together and can you do that? Now let me put a big umbrella package on this whole thing. That's kind of the leadership, the ability to run the business, but then there's also um, who's going to – who's are they going to buy this business, and what is that price tag going to be that's going to go to the current generation? Is that all acceptable? Number one. Number two, who's going to be the owner, and who's going to have how much ownership, not from just a financial perspective, but from a control perspective? So let's say you have three kids in the next generation. Who's going to get how much ownership, and who's going to have enough ownership or voting shares to have the final say-so? Okay, the next question. When a family issue exists, how does this affect the continued operation of the business? Well, that's that's a big one, obviously. <clears throat> so family businesses are different than other businesses because what you've got is you've got the family element, which comes with unconditional love and support, right? Your family is always going to be your family no matter what you do. Um, but then there's the business aspect. The purpose of business is to generate a profit, right? Um, legally and ethically, but at the end of the day, you're here to try to make money. Just because you're related to me and you're my child or my dad or my cousin or my uncle or my brother doesn't mean you're necessarily cut out to do this work or that you are the highest level skill to do this work. So the family element and the business element can come into conflict, number one. Number two – they get blended together in the workplace. So we're trying to work here. We're trying to run a business. And now because you're my brother, you think that you get some leeway in how we run this business or the accountability or when you have to show up or how, much, how many vacation days you get because you're a family member and we happen to own this thing, right? 
So there are there's an attitude that just kind of comes with being a part of the family that because you own it, because you're related to dad or what have you, um, you can you've got a, a free reign to take more liberties than other people there, and that can cause problems. <clears throat> but let me let me let me twist it more to the solution. Um, there are because of this there are lots of issues that exist, but the number one solution to this problem is communication. Um, family businesses that are successful, the number one aspect that they report back as to why they're successful is that they have good communication. And that means a number of things. Um, it means having a, a – I'm going to call it a predetermined code of conduct where you have a sit-down over a period of time, and we come to an agreement on how we're going to run this business and what's expected of each other. Um, and it's not something that I tell you that this is what we're going to do. This is something I have to agree to. And that's why it's called a code of conduct, the, the ACME Family Business Code of Conduct. Um, and it's documented that we all have sat down and agreed to this is how we're going. These are the rules by which we're going to run this business. Um, second of all, you need to have a, um, a communication pattern. Um, you need to be you need to have your regular business meetings that you know happen weekly, monthly, quarterly, what have you. But you also need to have family business meetings where the family gets together typically once a quarter, but it could be once a month, where we talk about the issues that are present because we are a family in business. And this is the great thing about this is we're going to put ourselves in the room. We know what the topic is, and this is the opportunity for you to say what you need to say and for me to hear what you need to say so that there's no, commun there's no confusion about what I'm saying, what you're saying, and whether or not somebody heard it or not, because it's pre-designated meeting. And now I'm going to kind of go really deep here. Um, there's a concept called active listening. And the purpose, that, and I know that the listeners are thinking, oh, I've heard of that and I know what it is, but I will bet you you don't actually know what it is. When you get into conflict and many other communication issues, you need to actively listen. Active listening is convincing the speaker that you have perfectly understood what they've said. And so when they say something, you say, hey, wait, stop. Let me see if I got what you're saying. Are you saying A, B, C, D, E? And they'll say, no, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, well, tell it to me again. And they say it, and you keep doing this until you say, all right, I think I've got it. What you're saying is A, B, C, D, E, F, Y, and G. Is that what you're saying? And they'll finally go, yes, that's it. You finally got it. And now they can relax because they've been all pent up trying to tell you this thing and you haven't heard it. But let me point out, you don't have to agree with them. You can disagree with them. You can say, look, now that I understand what you're saying, let me explain to you why I disagree. But it might turn out that now that you've really heard it, um, that you do agree, either way. But the point is, is now the person feels that they've been heard, the conversation can move forward. And this is a phenomenal tool for family businesses because it's just uh, ripe ground for conflicts because you have family and business together. Great information, Henry. Thank you. Richard Callio is the third expert we interview. Richard Callio has 25 years involvement in retail automation and point-of-sale systems working with independent retailers. He helps in developing e-commerce and customer loyalty programs, as well as managing inventory and financial understanding. Okay, first question. Garbage in, garbage out. Connect this situation with a point-of-sale system. Well, point-of-sale systems are the bedrock. They're the, they're the truth in a manner of speaking at a retail business. So, And the inventory is the product. So if you want to have a correct reports, essential reports, uh, you have to have the right data, and it has to be correct. And it's been an age-old problem. I mean, Tom, Shea, and I have probably been in this business collectively over 50 years, and that's been an ongoing problem. But it's even more acute today because people shop online and look at your inventory before they come into your store. So it needs to be correct, described correctly, priced correctly, and all the essential uh, aspects and descriptors need to be there. So today it's more important than it was 25 years ago when I started in this business. Okay, thank you. Next question. Can we justify the return on investment of a new point of sale system when a person is selling their business? 
Yes, uh, it's kind of interesting because I'm finishing a project now for somebody who was uh, defined as essential in this COVID economy, and uh, and his, he just viewed it, and we came to a mutual agreement that the technology he had in place just couldn't provide the essential tools for today's marketplace because of the ability for people to buy online, pick up in store, people to have curbside pickup, and all the iterations that people have now because of these restrictions on how they want to buy from you, where they want to buy from you, and how they want the product delivered. And so I think it's essential. I mean, if you sell your business with an old technology, it's going to be discounted, and that new owner is going to have to invest in that new technology. If you put that in, today, I think you can, you can realize a return on investment that will be greater than the investment you make in the technology. Your business will be deemed appropriate for today's new economy. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to visit with Mike McCormick. Mike McCormick is a certified public accountant and certified tax coach with over 20 years experience. He was a retailer and authored The Preneur's Guide to Forming a Business Entity. Okay, Mike, here's your first question. Can a business change their legal entity status? Thanks, Marilyn. A business can change its legal legal filing status and its legal status within the state that it's doing business in. Um, there's two pieces to it. One is possibly changing registration with the Secretary of State, and then depending on if, how they're making that change, it would have a tax impact. So, for example, if they're going from a sole proprietor to a corporate entity structure in their state or going to an LLC structure in their state, either of those have tax implications. One, require, one out of the box requires a separate income tax return, the corporate filing structure. If they elect to be an LLC, the LLC has some, some additional flexibility built into it. By default, it's either a single-member LLC or a multi-member LLC, which would be taxed as a partnership. A single-member LLC would be taxed as a sole proprietor. Either of those structures can then further make uh, an, an election to be taxed as if it were a corporation, and then that entity that uh, could be further uh, changed to possibly elect S corporation status. So yes, it is possible for a business to change its entity structure uh, either at the outset or at some point during its uh, period of existence. Okay, great information. Thank you. Your second question, how does the legal entity affect how much the seller receives for their business? Marilyn, the, the type of entity in which business is being conducted could affect how the deal is structured. In other words, as an asset sale or an entity sale, or sometimes referred to as a stock sale, the, if, if the entity is set up as a corporation and an asset sale is affected, then the proceeds of the sale come into the corporation and then could be paid out to the owner as, as wages or as possibly a liquidating distribution of the corporation. If the entity is a, an LLC taxed as a sole proprietor, the proceeds from the sale of the assets come directly into the member or members in the case of a multi-member entity. Um, how much they receive is going to be mostly driven by the tax implications of how the transaction is structured. So in the previous examples, they were selling assets, but they could also sell their, their shares or their membership interests in the entity, and therefore the payments would be made directly to the owners, and it would be either taxed as a generally taxed as a capital gain transaction to the to the members or the shareholders. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. Expert number five is Tom Shea. Tom Shea is a fourth generation dealer whose family business started in 1922. On the topic of small business management, he has authored 12 books, including a college textbook on business planning and financial understanding. 
He has spoken at HPBA Expo many times. Okay, Tom, your first question. How do process and procedures come into play as a business owner considers selling their business? Well, Marilyn, I can think of it from a, a personal experience. I remember in one of our stores, we had a gentleman who was a Delta pilot who would come in, very friendly gentleman. And in a conversation, he said, you know, I'm going to retire here in a couple of years. And I'm thinking that I'd like to do this. I think I'd like to buy a business like this. Well, my first thought was, being a little proud of myself, that, well, my business went, ran pretty good. And why wouldn't you want to buy a business instead that wasn't running as good so that you could improve it and make it better? I thought we kind of had our act together. But at a later conversation, he said, no, I don't think I want to buy a business like this. He says, it's too much work. I, I, you put too much into it. And it was at that point I began to look at it and go, hmm, am I, am I looking like I'm the owner that is constantly here, that every decision being made is being made by me, that I don't have policies, I don't have procedures, I don't have staff that can take care of things, I can't go out for lunch, I can't take a vacation. So his comment caused me to think about how is my business set up so that it can run itself and it doesn't require me 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Okay, Tom, thank you. The next question, the business culture, can that affect a potential buyer and or the selling price of the business? Oh, absolutely. And again, from another experience that we had with a business, uh, we had a landlord that was just one mean, nasty person, hard to get along with. And we got to a point where we just decided we were going to sell it. So we engaged a, a business broker that we knew, and he began to advertise our business for sale all across the United States and Canada. And I remember the day he called to say, someone's coming. This person's flying in this weekend. They're over a 1,000 miles away. They saw one of our ads, and they're going to come and look at, their, at your business over the weekend. We got to Monday, and I called the business broker and said, well, what happened? I was looking. I was stayed in the store the whole weekend to watch and see what was going on, thinking I'll figure out who this person is. And he said, well, here's the sad news. He, he didn't come. He came to his town, but he, as fate would have it, stayed with a friend. And when he got here, the friend was asking, what are you here for? And he said that he came to look at buying a business, our business. And he said, well, where's that business located? And he was told. And he goes, oh, no, I don't care what the business is. You don't want to buy that business because the people who own that place, who own the building, not the business, but the people who own the building are just evil, mean, nasty people. And gentleman left, and that was the end of the deal. Well, my example comes from that of a person who would be your landlord. But there was a business culture that even poured over business occupying the space. So the bottom line is that if your business culture is not one of a great customer service, quality products, good looking, clean business, great service department, then just as what happened in our business, you may find that your reputation gets out somewhere and no one is going to want to buy the business. Hence, the business culture is extremely important to a potential buyer and can greatly affect what the selling price is for the business. Okay, great information. Thank you, Tom. Following Tom Shea is another expert, Joe Baer. Joe Baer is on the Editorial Advisory Board for Visual Merchandising and Store Design Magazine and co-author of Mastering Store Merchandising. He has over 20 years of experience in the industry and hosts the Iron Merchant Competition each year at the International Retail Design Conference. Okay, our first question is, for a person selling their business, what can you do for them? Well, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, that's a great question for somebody selling their business. And really, I can help them several ways 
using my skills in visual merchandising and knowledge of retail design. First and foremost, the thing that I would want to do to help them is to elevate the perceived value of their business. And ultimately, that is the goal of what we do as visual merchandisers. It's our goal to elevate the perceived value of the product in your store or the services in your store. And by applying these same visual techniques, but now focusing on how your business looks, you know, how is your brand represented? How can we elevate the perceived value of your business, you know, by um, cleaning it up, paying attention to the visual element, uh, trying to minimize visual clutter, and, uh, you know, really using that as a way to sell your business, to focus on what your key strengths are, what your core services are, and how you're presenting those. The other thing about visual merchandising that is helpful for somebody in selling their business is it's also about being resourceful. And you're finding clever ways to make great visual impact without having to go through the expense of a remodel or a renovation or some of those uh, costly things that go along um, with a business model sometimes. So visual merchandisers, we use our creativity, our cleverness, and our resourcefulness, you know, to get in there and uh, with some fresh paint, some great graphics, some organization techniques, um, we can make it so when that potential seller comes in, you know, they feel a sense of confidence in the business that they are, are looking to sell. Um, and, and we do that, one, by just taking a look at the business, giving it our own visual assessment or what we call a visual audit, and then coming up with the plan with the store owner or the business owner, you know, about what their goals are. And then I always recommend doing a visual blitz and pull the team together, um, try to knock as many things off that list as you can you know, in a day or two that's, that's focused on visual merchandising to improve that. So what do you think, Marilyn? Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, it does. Great information. Okay, now for our next question. How does the psychological factor of what you do affect a potential buyer? You know, I think uh, psychology affects any buyer. And I would apply the same principles of psychology that you do to a typical customer in a store. But in this type place, you're thinking of the potential business buyer as the customer. So you want to play to their psychology. You want to understand them as your target market just in the same way that you're trying to understand the target customer for your store. You know, how does that um, business person think? What is important to them? What are they looking for in a potential business that they want to buy? Um, and then using our, our tricks of color and graphics and engaging with the emotions um, to connect with that buyer. You know, you want to understand what are they looking for in a business? What is it that they want to invest in? And the more you understand that, the better you can influence them. You know, you want to tap into their imagination by showing them, you know, the, the room to visualize the possibilities for your business or how they want to see your business evolve in new hands. Um, and you want to tap into their senses, just, you know, our human emotion. And it's through those things, you know, making sure that when they come into the business, it smells good, and it, it looks good, and it feels good. And, you know, maybe there's something that, you know, a hospitality element that they even taste, a, a cup of coffee, a, you know, a kind bottle of water or something like that. But you want to leave a good taste in the buyer's mind. So, you know, we want to fulfill that need for the buyer. The buyer, just like a customer, has a need that they need to fulfill. 
You know, that's what psychology about is about is, um, you know, understanding human needs and finding a way to fulfill those needs. And we can do that by, you know, providing emotional satisfaction with your business by how well it's branded, how comfortable the space is, how organized it appears from a business standpoint, you know, and, and how we guide our customers or your, your buyer through the journey of your experience. So I think those, you know, uh, elements help to reinforce the, you know, the thoughts of the buyer and, you know, trigger their psychology for fulfilling their needs. And also remember, this is very important because a potential buyer is going to see the parts of your store experience or your business that the customer does not always see. So make sure you're taking that, those uh, psychology thoughts and the rules of visual merchandising to your back-to-house areas. You know, they want to see an efficient system. So layering in, you know, graphics, messages, positive messages, organization systems all trigger a sense of, you know, confidence in, in the buyer. Even the restrooms. Don't forget to look at the restrooms. And certainly today, with COVID-19 factoring into our decisions, you're going to want to make sure that you're reinforcing a safe, sanitary environment, you know, and you have effective systems in place to keep your customers and your employees safe and, you know, while you're still maintaining a quality business experience. So that safety factor, that comfort level is such an important part, you know, of, of the psychology in our stores, making sure that Gus feel comfortable and safe. So we want to make sure that that's a part of the message that the buyers are seeing as well. So what do you I think, think, Marilyn? I think that's great information, and thank you. You'll be glad you get to meet Tom Porterfield. Tom Porterfield is a certified public accountant. He is also a certified franchise executive and QuickBooks Pro Advisor. Porterfield's niche is independent retailers with emphasis on payroll and human resources. He also provides comprehensive audit and review engagement. Okay, Tom, your first question. Is accounting all black and white? Or is there room for interpretation with accounting for a small business owner? Well, one would think that accounting would be black and white, but, you know, really accounting is, is very theoretical. You know, at the same time, financial accounting and taxation are really often at odds. And the bottom line is, you know, when you look at, at the value of a business, it's ultimately determined by the consistency and quality of earnings. And, you know, sometimes owners want to minimize the tax effect of uh, the business, and they're tempted to run expenses through the business that, that maybe, you know, are not, not always, you know, purely business-related. So often, you know, like I said, accounting and tax motives are, are really at odds. Uh, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, for every dollar of tax deductions, that that is uh, expense in a company, there's probably less than 30 cents of tax savings. If you turn that statement around and consider that every dollar of earnings probably yields the owner three and a half to five times value when they ultimately come to sell the business, you can see you know how how there's a lot of uh, disparity between what you want to do financially and what you want to do tax wise so going back to the original question is it um, you know is there room for interpretation absolutely you've got to look at every situation and think about the um, theoretical aspect of it and then what the what the motive of the owner is um, in the situation someone that is uh, thinking about selling their business in three to five years it's probably going to be really focused on generating earnings versus trying to minimize the tax benefits um, or tax uh, cost of the business. 
Okay, thank you. Now, you're for your second question, what complications, changes, or opportunities does the pandemic create as a business owner considers selling their business? Now, the pandemic will certainly impact the sale and transfer of small businesses. Businesses that have been boosted by the pandemic may be in higher demand, and owners may want to consider accelerating the timing of an exit while the business is good. For businesses that have been negatively affected by the pandemic, it may take several years to restore profitability and get the valuation back to pre-pandemic levels. It seems that a positive impact of the pandemic has been that many, while many people are home, uh, working from home, they're, they're considering the possibility of buying a business and there's, there really is some pent up demand for good businesses right now. You know, another reason why owners may want to accelerate an exit event, um, you know, would be, you know, that there is a, a good pent up demand at the current, uh, in current environment. Um, you know, regardless of the timing of the sale of a business, demonstrating strong earnings and consistent earnings is really the key driver to getting the, the most value out of the business. Thank you. We've got the expert, and our final one today is Mark Stoner. Mark Stoner has a very complete understanding of the service business. As the author of Blue Collar Gold and his own service company with 25 trucks on the road, Mark is equipped to help you make sure the service department is profitable and operates as a service of your business, not just your job. Okay, Mark, here's your first question. How often do you see the owner of the business also being the lead service technician? I think when we did a survey of the industry back in 2012 and then again 2016, approximately um, 50% of the industry was most was owner, and then the owner was one to two person operation. In the harsh, and also then in the uh, one of the recent uh, magazine articles for the industry, it showed that approximately uh, 60 to 70 percent of the hard stores, when they sold the product, someone else, the subcontractor or the homeowner, installed their product. So there's uh, it's it's at least 50 percent, and then. Uh, but I think our industry is moving toward more non-owner uh, operated, owner installed um, divisions, and that's where I think it's very exciting for us as an industry to move more towards service. And uh, you know, as my business is, it's, it's grown tremendously from the service aspect. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, second question: selling a business or selling a job. What does this mean, service industry? So one of the one of my favorite books in this industry is the E Myth Revisited, and in that book he talks about, you know, are you building a job for yourself or are you building a business? And really, what he meant in that book and what we how we do it is, if the business won't work without you, you've basically built a job. If the you do and so you don't really own a business, you own a job. If you if your business will work just fine without you, and it can stay profitable, and the customers get taken care of, and the money gets deposited in the bank, and everything gets handled, you you have more of a business. And so, as our industry grows up and matures, a lot more people understand the need to and to switch it from being a job to a business. And then secondly, when you go to sell the business, I learned the hard way. When I was a one-man operation, I fell off of a roof. I got hurt. I decided I wanted to sell my business. I was very busy. I had maybe uh, maybe a $300,000 service business. I thought I could get $300,000 for it. I was very wrong. Nobody really wanted to buy my job that I had built myself, so it had very little value on the market. And most of the time, the people who are buying businesses um, that they, they, they want to buy that would pay for yours, they, they're not trying to buy themselves a job. They're trying to buy themselves a business that has X amount of profit 
without them having to do the physical work and maybe even any of the work. So if you're going to sell your business, you want to make sure that uh, you have all the processes in place and uh, all of your standing operating procedures in place so that it will run and has more value at the end of the day when you're ready to retire or sell or move on from this industry. Thank you, Mark. To ask questions or begin the process, you can call us at 727-823-7205 or visit profitsplus.org slash HPBA to meet and learn more about each of the experts.